Now that we have a clearer idea of how this 10-bit relay monstrosity actually operates, let's take a look at some of the mistakes that I made while designing it and building it. And the, the first big mistake is that uh, while I really like the way that the design looks, it's extremely difficult for troubleshooting. So you can see that down the bottom right hand corner of each board is this uh, single long quarter inch piece of all thread uh, and it holds all of the boards together using nuts, washers, lock washers, and these little uh, nylon spacers. And it keeps all the boards evenly spaced and very rigidly mounted, but it's very difficult to get apart. If I need to, you know, get to one of these boards in the middle, I have to take either all of the boards in front of it or all of the boards behind it off to get to it. So everything has to come apart and go together in a very specific order. And it's very time consuming. The other problem is how the boards are connected electrically. So you can see that we have these exposed uh, wires that run through the boards and they're all uh, soldered to each board on the back. Um, and this looks very cool. I love the exposed look of it, but because it's soldered to each board, whenever I want to take a board off, I have to desolder that wire. And invariably this ends up uh, ruining the wire, I end up bending it, trying to get the wire out. And I also end up lifting pads, which ultimately ruins the board. And then I have to you know, go out to the mill and cut another board. Um, and I, I ran into this problem actually when I first put it together and fired it up, I had some pretty large issues, uh, particularly with some of the carry boards here, as well as you know this, this uh, ALU board on the back. And if I had a problem with the ALU board on the back, that's not, a, not the most difficult one to take off. But these carry boards, these carry registers in the middle were much more difficult to get to. And I actually ended up lifting some traces and having to cut some new boards. Now the other issue that I ran into with this actually comes more from an electrical and, and power draw point. So we'll just plug it in right quick and I can demonstrate it to you. So we'll demonstrate this by uh, turning on all of the switches. So that way we have um, 1023 plus 1023. Now you'll notice first that I, I flipped this switch on here and the light kind of flickered and didn't really go on. These switches were just really cheap switches I got on Amazon. So if I were to redo this, I would uh, maybe spring for something a little more robust that can handle more switching before they start to fail. Um, now you can see here we have uh, all, the, all the switches on, all the LEDs are on. So this is 1023 plus 1023. The answer will come out to 2046, which will be uh, all of the LEDs illuminated except for the very first LED. So if I push the little button, uh, you can see that we didn't get that answer. Um, so it didn't actually do the math correctly. You can see that we have three LEDs that didn't come on. And if I push the button again, those LEDs don't come on. Um, and this problem stems actually from these little diodes here. So to demonstrate the issue that we're having with the diodes, we'll move this out of the way and pull in a little breadboard to show the problem. So you can see here on my breadboard that I have two relays set up with uh, two LEDs and a collection of buttons and diodes. Now the relays are set up with uh, five volts coming into the common pin. Um, the coil is grounded out through these green wires and the normally open has a 1000 ohm resistor feeding into our LED. And this is just so I don't burn the LEDs out with uh, five volts as it travels through. Now the coil itself is energized through these buttons and diodes. So each button is connected up to five volts here. And then when I push the button, five volts travels into our kind of row of diodes down here. And depending on which button I push controls how many diodes the five volts flows through before it reaches our coil in our relay. So if I push the first button, you can see that the yellow light comes on because five volts is flowing through the button through just one diode into the coil to energize it. Now if I push the middle button, 
you can see that the light still comes on, uh, but now we're sending that five volts through two diodes. Now, if I push this third button here, you can see that the LED does not come on. And that's because the voltage is now flowing through three diodes. And each diode, even though it operates as a one-way valve, essentially, it allows current to flow in one direction, but not in the reverse direction. And that was very important in some of the design choices that I made on the calculator. It experiences something called forward voltage drop. And so each diode that the voltage has to flow through experiences a voltage drop, lowering the voltage on the other end. And we can actually see that pretty well if we just use a digital multimeter here. Um, so you can see here that I've got the uh, multimeter set up to DC. And if I just probe my little five volts here, you can see that I've got 5.07 volts. Um, now, if I, if I put the probe on this first junction here and I push the button, you can see we get 4.9596 volts coming through. So there's a, a very minute voltage drop through the button. But if I check on the other side of that diode, you can see now we're down to 4.1 volts. So the coil is only seeing 4.1 volts. Now, 4.1 volts is still enough to operate this five volt coil, which is why our button turns on. Now, if I push the second button, you can see again, we have five volts well, 4.96 flowing into this junction of the, the diodes. But if we check at the end of the both diode string there, you can see we only have 3.34 volts coming out. And that's still just enough to operate the coil here, but we're getting right on the edge of what that coil is capable of. So if I push the third button and I check the voltage here, you can see now we're down to 2.6 volts, and that's not enough voltage to operate the coil. Now these are just uh, standard line signal diodes, but they have, as you can see, a fairly large voltage drop across them. Now the second setup that I have down here is using something called Schottky diodes. In standard line signal diodes like this, they use a semiconductor to semiconductor barrier to create that kind of one-way valve. In Schottky diodes, they use a semiconductor to metal barrier, and that creates a different kind of barrier that has a much lower forward voltage drop. Um, so again, I'll keep my little probe here. If I, if I push the button, you can see that that comes on, the LED comes on with no problem. And you can see that coming into this first pin here, you know, we got our 4.95 volts, but then coming out of that, out of that diode, we have 4.46 volts. So we had a much uh, lower voltage drop across that diode. And then we can see that as we go down the line. Here's the second button, the LED still comes on. The third button, the LED still comes on. The fourth button, the LED still, still comes on. The fifth button, the LED does not come on. So if we check that one here, you can see we got, you know, 4.98 coming into that. Coming out of that, we've got 4.58. Coming out of two diodes, we're, uh, you know, we're down to 4.1. Coming out of three diodes, down to 3.6. Coming out of four diodes, we're at 3.2, which was still just barely enough to operate it. Uh, and then coming out of five diodes, we're at 2.8. So you can see five diodes puts us at 2.8, but if we go back and check this first one, three diodes was putting us at 2.6. So you can see that each Schottky diode has a much lower voltage drop. Now, when I built the relay calculator, I wasn't really paying a whole lot of attention to that. And I ended up running into some serious power draw issues and voltage drop issues, especially because I did all of my testing using these uh, relays that I I don't even remember where I got them. I got them fairly cheap from someplace. And the reason that I use these relays is that they're just the right size to fit across a breadboard. So it makes breadboarding this whole setup a lot easier. However, the little G5 V1 relays that I use on the relay calculator here are a lot smaller than those other relays. And this was good because I wanted the overall board size to be compact and I needed to squeeze as much as possible, but it meant that I couldn't breadboard them because they didn't fit over that channel in the center of the breadboard. What this meant is that the Omron relays have 
slightly different properties than those other relays that I was using. And the Omron relays actually call for a minimum operating voltage that is 80% of the max. So that should be right around four volts. So while the design that I breadboarded worked, I was running into issues where I was getting too much voltage drop across line diodes and it wasn't working here. So you can see here that on our sequencer board that the relays actuate and send five volts out. Now the five volts comes through these data lines up top here, comes down here and goes through a diode. Now it goes through this diode and that's a voltage drop right there. And then it comes down into here and goes through the center pin of both of the switches. And then it comes out of you know, the top pin and then it goes through another diode. So there's another voltage drop. It goes into the data lines all the way back to the ALU. And then it has to actuate one relay or maybe even two relays, depending on what number it is. And so this was proving to just be too much power draw with too many voltage drops from those diodes. Now I did replace these diodes on the top here, just these right here with some shot key diodes. And that immensely helped the problem. But you can still see that I have, you know, rows of diodes here and here. And these are all still those, uh, you know, little signal diodes that have a large voltage drop across them. And so when we get to, you know, that situation of having all the switches up and trying to do a calculation on all of that, we're just right on the edge of the amount of voltage that can operate the relays successfully. And that's how we end up with some errors and you know some, some calculations that don't quite work just right. Another way I could have avoided this problem was by changing from five volt relays to 12 or 24 volt relays. Omron makes the, the, the same relay package in three volt, five volt, 12 volt, 24 volt, a bunch of different variants. Uh, so I could have theoretically used higher voltage relays and not had to change the design any at all. And the reason that this would have fixed the problem is that uh, that 80% minimum operation voltage is a much different window if we're talking about 80% of 5 volts versus 80% of 24 volts. So 24 volt gives us a much wider window to have the, the relays operate at minimum voltage. And that relatively small voltage drop uh, across the diodes, it wouldn't have caused any of the issues that we're seeing here. So that wraps up my binary relay calculator. Next, we'll pull out the hexadecimal relay calculator and take a look at it.